four and nine on Ezreal and three one and two on Ezreal as well. So overall, he's just been playing fantastic in this. Uh, this I completely agree. Kind of rookie player yeah. coming in, not having nerves, is impressing everybody, including his teammates. Yeah, it's the funny thing about Lod because he has, I believe, five LCS games from the previous split. He subbed mm -hmm. for a couple of teams out there, so. Uh, that might make him an ineligible, like, official Capital R rookie. But also, it's, like, kind of too bad that players like Balfrost are out there because he's having a really good sort of breakout season as a full-time pro. And definitely got to give some respect to Lot. As the picks and bans begin, Cloud9 removing the flex pick with Sandra that both Seraph and Ninja love to play. Those are the two of the very big playmakers on this squad. No trundle for Seraph either, trying to get rid of some of his good split-pushing powerful champions. There's still a lot available, though. Oh, absolutely. You have to assume that Vladimir's going to come out last banned from Envy. Mm -hmm. So Cloud9, the last thing they'll pinch here. It is really interesting, kind of mm -hmm. tunneling on Envy's style a bit more. Like, I think the bans are really very representative of the differences in these teams' styles. Like, yeah. the Lissandra ban, I think, completely crystallizes what Envy is about, which is Seraph or Ninja being the huge playmaker, making the whole I press R within team fight play. And then Lot, as we've been talking about him, is always the consistent backline damage, playing Ezreal's and Lucian's and whatnot, and, and putting out so much damage output that it's okay that Seraph and Ninja are, are more utility than damage up because Lot has been so consistent and trying to remove some of these tools as Cloud9 are banning things out. Um, as Envy are banning, like teamfight mages, right? They don't yeah. need Seraph and Ninja to be doing all the damage. Yeah, I definitely think that you need to ban out these mid laners, take them away from Jensen. I assume there might be a Karma first pick here for Smoothie. Uh, pick I it up like really it. early on. With Rek'Sai and Kindred up, I don't really believe in a first pick Elise is the best choice. You'd probably go Rek'Sai if you do. Yeah, uh, 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 of those three, I think Rek'Sai is considered the best, but we actually saw a match right. in China last night that was uh, Graves versus Kindred, actually, and Clear Love had amazing performances on Graves. Not Medios. everyone cares. Yeah, media with the rec Medios with the Rek'Sai, though. Champion that he's been gravitating towards a lot, and they pick it up very early on for him. The Sightstone allows him to control the vision early. I assume that you take Karma here, because NBA actually flex Karma. Yeah. And even though we are on 6.12 here, where Rod of Ages and all the other Catalyst items don't give you quite as much health restore on mana usage, Swain is still very popular for some of these teams. You see Karma's pick rate incredibly high. She's in about 85% of pro games right now. Yep. And Swain, I think a little bit below that. And still, though, worth a first round red side pick. Yeah, I actually think picking these both together is great. The synergy oh, great is a big thing, right? Karma just jumped up in popularity because of the fact she enables Swain and Vladimir and those champions. So it gives him another way to get in, gives him a little more shielding. And we'll see, because Ninja did play Karma last week. It may go to him, it may go to Haku, though. Right, you've got a bit of a interesting flex right here, and we know the impact almost exclusively plays tanks and the tankier styles of fighters. So you can even like assume a Swain top lane is good. Yeah, and you know what's really funny is uh, Cloud9 had banned Trundle this game, and they had banned Trundle previously against Apex in all three games mm -hmm. because they just don't want to play against that in the top lane because it shuts down the tankiness that Impact would bring to the team. Yeah, most of what Impact's playing is Maokai and Shen with like the occasional Trundle or Fizz game. You know, if you go back a couple of weeks there and you can see Shen picked up once again. Uh, Karma off the table, so Nami gets grabbed up here. And this I think actually makes sense because while you normally can't expect Karma to go in the support role, I could totally see Karma mid Nami support and pushing the, the supports down even farther, right? And giving less options to Smoothie. So a good laner in Nami gets grabbed up and the early pick on Shen, which Seraph has played before, so there is some priority on that. Actually, maybe he hasn't, but I feel like it's a champion he would play. The I guess he I mean, his, his champion pool is incredibly big. Yeah, I take it back. I don't believe Seraph has played a Shen game yet this split, but I know something he'd be able to. Lucia gets grabbed up, and the Graves does come through, so Proxen actually going to go on that champion. At least in Kinder, we're still up. Wants the Graves anyway. And this is after all the Yomu's nerfs and stuff, too. It's like his builds actually went down in, in strength in some way. Same with Illusion, who might go back towards a, an S3 for Infinity Edge style build. Yeah, he might go towards that S3 for Infinity Edge build. But the Black Cleaver build against the Shen and a Rek'Sai, I think that you might go for that. Uh, the Graves build, Yomu's not incredibly popular too much in the jungle. You yeah. kind of just go straight for Phantom Dancer second, or you go Usually. for the Hex. Clear Love actually did it, which is weird. But uh, China's not on uh, 12 yet, I don't think. So that's part of the reason, I assume. Either way, going down a really weird rabbit hole of picks and yes. items and whatnot is basically we've got double marksman here with uh, no tank yet for Envy Ooh. as Cloud9 are going to yeah. reinforce their lineup with a Cassiopeia in the mid lane. 
alongside Sneaky's Ash. So a lot of control and plenty of damage in this lineup. Yeah, a lot of engage here, and I love the Cassiopeia pick. It's so much damage. She's one of the highest damage mages in the game, and even with the changes, incredibly potent, arguably even more so because of the fact that you can, even if you miss the Q, your E is still on that really low cooldown, fractions of a second. You mm -hmm. get to spam it out. And when we saw it last week from Keen, I was like, People are going to start playing this. This is going to come up in scrims. Yeah. We're going to see some Cassiopeia coming into this week. I doubt this is going to be the only one we see. Definitely agree. The last pick comes through. It's going to be Braum support right here. The Karma is going to go, I assume, mid after all, with Top Swain being the other side of this one. So, uh, of course, Lucian Braum, a great dual lane, can stand up to Ashnami, I think. There's a pretty reasonable chance of that one. Ashnami actually has a little bit of anti synergy since you can't stack slows as of about a year ago. Uh, but interesting lineups here. Envy do finally have a tank for themselves. They wanted Braum over the Alistair. Cassia P, of course, won't have to buy boots thanks to her passive. And actually, right now, looking like Jensen's going Ignite to really put kill pressure on. And he and Midas can certainly get plenty of damage on a ninja if that happens. Yeah, that Ignite would come in handy a lot, especially since it'll stop the renewal. Yeah, they've got two Ignites coming through mm -hmm. because of Swain, because a little bit of that Karma Empowered W, if that ever does matter. So. As the champions do get locked in, you've got that Cassie Pierce Karma in the mid lane, Shen versus Swain up the top side, and Ash Nami facing off against Lucian Braum. Yeah, and the Lucian Braum lane is kind of tricky because usually against ranged supports, you don't want to go up against them. But with Braum Lucian, I mean, if you land a Q, you land an auto attack, Lucian's going to make that stun happen very quickly. Yes. And the Braum pickup over the Alistars, another reason for that is just the Nami wave, right? You stop it with the Unbreakable. One way of stopping that engage. They have to watch out for the Ash Arrow, though, as well. Absolutely agree. It's a great tool to use there. So a great choice in champs. And we'll see who's going to win this one. Send your predictions to us online. Tweet the hashtag C9 winner, hashtag NVWin, and let us know who it's going to be. The best of three to start out the day. Two of the four best teams in North America. The question is, where do they stand in this? Cloud9 believed to be the number three team, but NV right now number three in the standings at five and one. Can they take down one of the kings of North America in game one? Envy still trying to establish themselves as a top power right now. And honestly, we're almost at the halfway point and people are like, okay, we're getting a little more of a solidified idea here, even with best of threes. Like, is Envy really the real deal? Last week against Immortals and CLG, it's like, yeah, they're looking really solid. They deserve to be in that top half. They definitely do. I know we mentioned it during rehearsal. I don't think we said it on air just yet, but that series against Immortals from Envy was super close. It could have been a 2-0 either way. Yeah. Mistakes that could have been fixed on either side. And Envy's next three matches are this one against Cloud9, then tomorrow against TSM, mm. and then they get Echo Fox, who hasn't been doing so well. So they're going to be somewhere between, you assume, 8-1 and one and like 6-3, and three. You know, based on expected results, like those are a pretty good record of the first half of the NALCS. Especially for a new team. Especially Envy for was team. coming in saying like, okay, well, we're one of the, <laughs> basically one of the teams that had the least amount of practice coming in. We had a week before we got together and played in LCS and they've been yeah. playing well. I mean, Cloud9 are the original new to LCS Smash the World team. True. Cloud9 joined the North American LCS in summer 2013 and went 25 and three which was a ridiculously, ridiculously good record. Immortals the only team that have beaten that win rate as far as matches are concerned. And now you've got Envy hoping to follow those footsteps and be uh, another dominant new North American team. Yeah. The 25 and three man, super weeks, rest in peace. The funny thing is we're actually probably gonna play more total games. Yeah. Uh, I think you're pretty guaranteed to, because 36, 36 at minimum per team instead of 28. And speaking of 36 being twice of 18, Cloud9 has not been 2 0 All of their games have gone to three, except for one that they 2 0 So Cloud9 has seal. never actually lost a series without taking a win. That's true. But at the same time, it's weird because we talk about them splitting the supports back and forth yeah. and having Smoothie play a game as Bunny watches and Bunny comes in. Yeah. Well, when they win, they're winning 2-1 more than they win 2-0. Yeah. That swap actually loses them a game anyway. <laughs> And again, teams say, oh, we're experimenting, we're trying other things, but you'd almost expect the player swap to make the game even cleaner than it was before. It hasn't yet been the case as the internet scrambles to find reasons for yeah. their favorite team losing games sometimes. Sneaky and Smoothie are matching up the 2-on-2 two -two against Hakuho and Lod, and it looks like that Lucian Braum giving a lot of respect over. Hakuho misses the last hit, and now they have to fight under the turret to get some back. Yeah. It's a bit of a tricky situation in this lane swap because you have a little bit of gank assistance for the mid lane, so you want to free up your jungler, and especially on like Envy's side, and your Swain is going to beat the Shen early on. 
So you kind of have to sack a little bit of the bottom lane, but this is still a kill lane if you have procs and show up and you can land the Q. We had Bedios take an interesting route where he took half of his left side jungle, then went down to the red, then grabbed Scuttle. And he's coming back around to give that sort of delayed blue buff transfer over to his mid laner. It's actually a really, really standard route for Meteos. I'm actually surprised more players aren't punishing that. I know Rainover did it uh, when they matched up against Immortals. Seeing impact in the battle with Sarah puts the dodge in, which, you know, blocks a couple of auto attacks. And right now, those top laners are equal in farm as we check out the other sides of the map. But yeah, Proxen had started top side, you know, did his, his full top side clear. But then actually had a route to just take a blue buff away. Yeah, that's true. It's Rek'Sai, so, so the route that he took is kind of a Rek'Sai route where you get the Gromp buff, and then right. you can do the camps faster. You ignore your blue, don't have to do it. You'll hand it off to your mid laner later. Right. And then you go and do the right side of the jungle faster. There's that one, and then there's you do the Krug start, and then you clear that side and try to gank mid. Yeah. But in competitive, you very rarely see bottom side starts because you want to give that buff over to yeah. your, your duo lane, which uh, I believe start. both of these duos did. Yeah. Uh, so, Gromp start, Krug start, etc. Moving forward to the matchup as we now are seeing the lanes start to pan out a little bit differently. Uh, mid lane completely equal. Top lane actually really good job by Impact. Yeah. For, for Seraph rush picking the, the Swain trying to win the matchup, Impact's doing completely fine. And the bot side duo, it's actually plus five for Laud right now. And Smoothie's normally the laning support, right? So. Uh, yeah, okay, the wave's pushing. That's, you know, some of this here. But honestly, against one of the premier duos, Sneaky Smoothie is a plus 10 CSD duo lane. Props to Laden Hakuho. Yeah, they took the Karma away from Smoothie. It's actually a really good strategy, giving it to, prop to Ninja and making sure that Smoothie doesn't have that support that he's been actually incredibly dominant on. He's had one Nami game so far. Mm -hmm. uh, so having to go back to that, it's range support. It'll help out a bit, but it's still not going to have this exact same effect because it, it's a different trading pattern, for sure. sure. A little bit more uh, skill involved with the skill shots. I gotta say, massive props to Impact. He is actually straight winning this lane yeah. farm-wise. Every time we see him battle Seraph, he's like chunking his mana down and winning in health bars. I just honestly just huge respect to Impact for how he's playing this lane matchup. I'd love to actually see this in more detail at another time. But uh, yeah, Shen over Swain doesn't feel like a matchup you're supposed to win that well. Yeah, uh, not typically, especially early on, but still, you're talking about the respect here that you're that you're showing impact. I mean, Seraph feels the same way that you do. Right. He looks up to this guy. When he came over in, I believe, summer 2014, as one of, if not the first Korean import to North America, it was around the time that Impact, you know, he had won Worlds right before that. Mm -hmm. And he really looked up to this guy. And the reason he does is Impact will play what the team needs. And Seraph considers himself now a team player. He wants to be Impact and considers him the final boss right now. He's definitely one of the original best top laners, absolutely. Impact has sadly only found limited success in North America. Sometimes his teams fall apart. Sometimes, in this case, he's saying it's kind of his fault on an individual level. A lot of it is he plays for his team. He's not like that flame, like dominate lane. He's never been that guy. He's always been play what the team needs. Right. And that's why Seraph respects him. And that's also one of the reasons that if his team, you know, isn't doing too well, then he's not going to do too well. Sure. It's kind of like if you're already snowballing, he's going to help you even more. Mm -hmm. so he needs some extra carries. Nice Q lands there from Jensen, but an empowered Soul Flare comes in, and Ninja kind of pushes him right back out. Mid laner is pretty close to equal. Jensen, though, a little bit ahead right now. You're seeing him plus about 10. And nice of him to eke out the advantage. Lands another Q. And yeah. Ninja's got to be a little bit afraid of that. Yeah, Ninja's going for the Athenes again. It's the magic resistance, and then it's also the heal. And it's got very low AP on it now. It's, a, it's actually a support item for the most part. You can make good use of it when you're in team fights and give even more healing, but honestly, it's not the whole offensive. I have the Abyssal Scepter blow you up build. Yeah, or Rod of Ages even to have a little more mana. It is a very defensive one. It's very support focused, so. Yeah, he did this before as well. Yeah. Well, when you're running double marksman and a swain, you've certainly got enough damage, so I like the idea of specking a little bit tankier. And it's one of the nice things about champions uh, like Karma, and I'll actually say Ezreal as well, where you can pick them early, and then depending how the draft shapes up, you can say, oh, I want to play this style of the champion. You know, I can go for Leandri's poke build, or I can go for the Athene's supportive build based on the champions we lined up oh. here. Now the play into the mid lane. Nice flash, but Ninibut's going to be mirrored here by Meteos. Do they have the rest of the damage they need? Q's going to land for the movement speed. There's the Ignite on top of the flash. Hopefully that's going to be the kill. First blood comes through to Jensen. A great gank by Meteos. Yeah, the flash immediately afterwards to knock him up with the chase there. So Ninja not able to get away. And first blood goes over to Jensen. We're talking about the featured matchup here. Jensen has been dominant 
Finn making a lot of plays here, and that first pick Rek'Sai coming up huge for Meteos. Three summoners burn for the play, but super worth it right now. A thousand gold lead for Cloud9 as they look to pinch down in the bottom lane. And you can see that with Braum coming over, there's just no chance for Lotso. He's been pushed out, down six minutes. He's not going to get any of this wave either. And a lot of pressure made. Ninja going to burn a teleport to get back into lane, which means he won't have any map pressure either. And that teleport hurt him quite a bit. Yeah, put a lot of damage onto that turret. He had to TP back into lane. The ignite was used from Jensen as well, so no summoner spells in that mid. But yeah, this bottom turret, because Proxen had to hold mid wave, mm -hmm. everybody can come down bottom. Meteos can come down here and do damage to this turret, and it's about one fourth HP right now. This is really adept play by Cloud9. I know it's something we've talked about before, but Cloud9 after high, can they do this? And it was honestly a very clean transition, a great first blood in the mid lane. He immediately makes the right choice to say, oh, we can pressure bot lane to deny a full wave, kill half a turret, and then really be no worse for the wear afterwards. So, uh, you know, great early game moves by Cloud9. They've known to be a good early game team. Yeah, and Sneaky kind of hiding out here. He's probably going to throw an arrow. There's no flash on Ninja. If this lands... Ooh, unlucky. Good dodge by Ninja. He's going to be okay. <laughs> Is it... Not even going to shove it up. He can't walk too far forward because he doesn't have vision on that right side. He's actually backing right now. He's afraid of um, Rexa coming back in. He would pretty much guarantee die if that happens. Yeah, he can't clear that tunnel either. He can't walk that far forward. Impact also is level 6, and Seraph cannot match the teleport. So there's actually a temporary window where C9 have the global advantage from the top lane. As long as they're willing to sacrifice some level of farm on that Shen. Easy blue buff handed over. Jensen's going to be happy with that one. Looks like they'll be totally okay with this. So, sitting at only a 500 gold lead now as the marksmen have caught back up. The jungler Proxen's doing quite nice. And, whoa, a miss taunt. Not going to be ideal for impact with the shield up. Seraph's yeah. going to land the roof, but Meteos is here. Seraph has summoners, and he also has a Proxen who stands still. Does not, I believe, get spotted by the Rek'Sai. But either way, they're not going to follow through on that push anymore. And we're all right with this one. Yeah, it's also a tier build for Seraph. It's a little unusual. You'll usually see yeah. the Rod of Ages right off the bat because it gives you the healing. He's not getting any blue buffs is, I think, part of mm -hmm. the reason he's doing a, a slightly more mana-heavy build. But, I mean, the Swain passive does give him mana back. True. Well, it's no. percentage of max mana. Well, he's going like a really heavy yeah. mana build. So, tier into, you know, either Proto Belt or a Rod of Ages, but a very, very mana-heavy build. Probably going to be like almost a Zillion build, a Cassiopeia build from sure. four. I mean, it, it'll it'll be more ability power, right? Like the more AP you get, the more mana you get, mm -hmm. it's going to be a huge conversion off the Seraphs. It's true. It's going to make his mana cost very low as well. Right. Uh, because of the tier actually cutting it by 15%. Mm -hmm. So it'll be interesting to see actually how long he can stay in his ultimate. Probably forever. Almost forever. I think that, that's pretty likely here on this one. Well, we'll have to track Sarah's progress over time. And I guess also the question is, he doesn't have to build as tanky either because he's got so much support. He's got a Brahm and a Karma to keep him alive. So I could see, like, doing a greedy or more offensive build pays off with the champions he's got. Like, I'm always really intrigued by item builds when you can start adapting the base what's going on. Proxen going to get knocked up there by Meteos. A lot of damage coming out of this Rex. I look at that punishment. Yeah, Proxen looked like he tried to attack twice there and got canceled autos just because he was in the bush and had walked out of it. So, looked like a little bit of stutter stepping there in Meteos. He sat around for a long time in that bush with his Tremor Sense. Yeah. Making sure that he could get the jump on him. So he actually chunks out Prox, and that allows Seraph to continue pushing up the wave. He knows the jungler's not there. And deals some damage to Impact. Yeah, it's starting to lose a little bit of health there. The Spectre's Cowl helping a bit, but with Seraph having basically infinite mana, it's certainly not easy to land against that kind of champion anymore. Jensen going towards a pretty offensive focus build as well. Morella Namakon, of course, makes sense against Swain, but also just a lot of mana and ability power with none of those being defensive stats. And his first two major items, Impact once again going for the battle against Seraph, taunts him up, and you see he's able to withstand a lot of this damage. I'm kind of surprised he's finishing Sunfire with uh, the fact that he's against magic damage dealers in most of these lanes. Uh, but doesn't want to finish the Spirit Message yet. He's finishing Sunfire first. Meteor's looking for a gank top. He saw Proxen, went the other way. Han's gonna land into the knockup, and Seraph can't move just yet. Now he's so low on health, and a great double flash gets away from the root, but now it's forced Seraph to run away. Proxen's here, and he gets himself out of that one, so the double flash meant nothing from the Cloud9 gank duo. Double flash, but they got a TP out of Ninja as well, so two summoners for two overall. Yeah. So honestly, an equivalent trade. Yeah, this is a shorter one for Ninja, though. If he canceled it, it's only that yeah, three-minute cooldown. 
So it's less severe, but certainly you're right. That cooldown does still get burned. And that means once again, Ninja has been unable to travel the map in any respectable way with his teleport. Meteos has just been keeping track of Prox in this entire game. He's putting down the Sightstone over and over again, walking through the jungle, using the Tremor Sense to establish dominance. And as much as that's true, though, Proxen's actually ahead significant gold over Meteos right now. Keep in mind, Meteos got 200 gold for a first blood, and he's still down about 300 other his under his opposite members. So, okay, Proxen's not ganking, but Envy's up in gold while uh, down a Hon kill. Yeah, it's honest honestly kind of interesting because 400 of that is Hakuho. Hakuho is the support he's up using his uh, Relic Shield and his Targon stacks, mm -hmm. and that's giving him a huge chunk of gold. But then in the mid lane, you can see right there, it's about 800 gold up for Jensen. And that's wow. where that big difference is for me, is that Cassiopeia having that much gold over her lane opponent is very scary moving forward. It really is. That's going to be one of the major carries of Cloud9. Because they didn't have a utility. AD Carry looking for that utility once again. Looking for another the, arrow, yeah. Well, but Cassiopeia is running for the top side, so Jensen's not even around them anymore. Oh, yeah. uh, you mentioned support gold. I want to kind of highlight something. Well, they're going to try to make a play top. Up. We'll talk about that later, because here comes Meteos. Ninja. Arm alarm goes off, but doesn't reveal where he's going. Yeah, they know Flash is down. They think they may have they actually for spotted it. him, and so it's going to be an Earth Drake here for wow. Mountain Drake. Mountain Drake, yeah, and there's going to be no contest, so Cloud9 looked to make the play top lane. They could have actually made the dive. There was almost no risk whatsoever in making that play. Sorry, no Sneaky W this time, and it's going to be the Dragon picked up by Envy. Well done to them, and that's actually going to play really well for them with this game going so slow. Mountain Drake is the best late game one. And Envy always plays slow, so arguably it's one of the best ones for this team as a stylistic point. Absolutely agree. So yeah, talking about Smoothie's gold income, uh, very rarely do you earn more gold from the ambient gold of Spell Thieves than the on hit oh, effect, wow. but he's actually only got 72 tribute gold. Yeah. He's not even trying to fight Hakuho and Lot. And to be fair, I get that Brahm and Lucian could pretty much just pop a Nami whenever they want, but that's still a little weird. But they are gonna go after Seraph. No flash. Taunt in the knockup into a ton of damage. Seraph has nowhere to go. A great kill picked up. Meteos finally makes the gank happen. Proxen late to the party. And all I can do is stand on the grave of Seraph as he's just lying there sad. Yep. Ending up clearing out the wave for him. Seraph, though, a little bit away from that Rod of Ages. Very close to being able to pick it up. It's a little miserable, though, because he's like 20 gold away. So he has to stay in base a little bit after. Yep. All right, we'll Pick see when he gets back oh. in on that one. He actually sells his refillable for it, so he can leave immediately. Okay. Rod of Ages and two that's stacking up now. 50 minutes in, he completes the Roa. Not terrible, just not super fast. We have Ninja continuing on towards more high ability power items. Probably a Death Cap be my guess, to have the highest power shields he can. The problem is, though, he doesn't have the biggest of carries as Lucian is going for the nerfed Yomu's build. And Seraph is honestly just a little bit behind now. Much less CS than either of his other carry lanes, and actually uh, less gold in the graves as well. So Seraph, a almost non-factor right now at this stage of the game. Yeah, his, his Swain needs to scale up. He's going to need about two, three items, especially with this build with the tier. Let's see if he ends up going for the Seraph's Embrace really early on and actually the completion. Just the chunk out there on the yeah. ninja. If you land poison, twin fing does more than double damage this stage of the game. The, the base value skills of character level and the empowered because they're poison damage skills of rank and well, he's maxing that E first. So it's all kind of on the poison empowered part, part of it. Yeah, and that's what gives you the heal as well is when they're poisoned and you use your twin fang. Yep, it gets more than twice as good. And that's the goal. Dodge the Q. He's not as crazy. You see Proxen yeah, just clearing away the camp, but his Raptor buff already got popped by a Trinket Ward. And we got to see what else can happen here because Ninja is just kind of slowly losing his turret. Over time, it's getting whittled down. Not by much, but it is losing a little bit of health. Extension just keeps playing the wave clear game, stacking up, you know, getting his tier fully charged. And, right, Jensen's charging a tier and winning his lanes. Sarah's charging a tier and getting killed and losing turret health. So, yeah. Uh, I know Envy likes to play for late game, but the you know the scaling matchups are kind of going all Cloud Nine's way. Yeah, I'm interested in this top lane though because Impact went for the full Sunfire Cape uh, instead of going towards more magic resistance. So he's right. actually going to start to get punished in this top lane. You're going to see Seraph actually deal a decent amount of damage to him now. Mm -hmm. it, it at least gives Impact wave clear. Mm -hmm. Like that's kind of the trade-off. It's like, well, I don't have to fight as long. I can just clear the minion wave away and then run out. 
and I can survive Laud when a mid-game teamfight happens. I can survive Prox when that happens. But yeah, it's a choice he made, and it's one that might punish him here. Pink board in the pit, and it's going to be the attempt at a nice Rift Herald here. Prox in the wars over the wall and sees this is happening. The question is, he can always E over then smite, and Cloud not trying to get him away. Zerif also coming around the wings, and here comes the attempt at a fight a little bit early. The smite's gonna go through, it goes to Meteos. They grab that one. There's no chance to steal it away, but now on to Prox, and they go. He's taking a lot of HP, jumps back over the wall. Zerif gets stunned up, though. Why even take that fight? Envy, arrow coming across the map as well, I believe, soon. Here it comes, looking for the snipe, and it's gonna land a Prox in space. He's gonna go down. Meteos with another kill, four to zero, Cloud9. Yeah, Proxen still had Flash, did not see that one coming. Sneaky with the good ultimate there from across the map to secure another kill, but they had to move up, so they're gonna lose bot turret, but they will get the Rift Herald, multiple kills, and that mid turret. And you can see Envy still not on the board with the turret just, or with a kill just yet. Yeah, they got the bottom outer turret, but mid, of course, already went down here, so they're pressuring bot lane, have to recall because Ash and Nami are coming down. Hawkshot reveals they will recall in time. And by the way, Glimpse the Void went to Jensen. So the Cassiope is the one who was able to grab the Rift Herald buff in all the chaos. Not normally the ideal champ, but he's what he, but that's what he's got. Still, that's gonna help him dominate that lane against Ninja even harder. 147 there. Videos doesn't even smite it. He gets it with an unburrow and an auto there. And then Proxen's in the back. Seraph has to walk all the way through. And he turns around and gets stunned by Jensen. And then the arrow from across the map, yeah. Really nice aim. Absolutely perfect there. And lines it up. Meteos picks up the kill with the Prey Seeker. Mm -hmm. And now a 1,000 gold lead for Cloud9. But there's pressure now because Lod got freed up. And if Envy are able to actually rotate towards the turret with this Mountain Drake buff. Pop Taco under the turret, but doesn't get quite enough damage done there. The bubble missed sadly as Seraph holds the front line, pushes in the wave. Bit of damage in the turret, but nothing really gained substantially. 1,200 gold lead for Cloud9. Definitely nice to have, but not game winning at this stage. We crash 20 minutes in. Baron spawns up. And Meteos kills off a ward. You know what I just thought about? What? In Brahm's lore, his shield is a door. He's literally holding the door. He is holding the door. Random aside. Worth knowing, though. Did you also know that in his lore, he saves a boy trapped in a mountain, uh, stuck behind an unbreakable door, by tunneling through the mountain itself? Yeah, he punches through it, right? Yeah, essentially. <laughs> I forget the, the specific acts that he did, but uh, can't break the door, take down the mountain. Yeah, a lot of speculation that is like Trundle or something that he saved, and there's true ice in there. Oh, I didn't know that part of it. And that Lissandra's the witch that like put him in there. So. Always an option. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot of great kind of speculation out there. Illuminati's conspiracy theory. Mm -hmm. Triangles, tinfoil hats, it was singed the whole time, yep. etc. Here we go. Top lane turret under fire and envy. Don't actually finish up the, the the tunnel. And that turret actually stays alive here. So Yeah, Jensen rotated towards the top side. And you always have to be wary of Sneaky throwing out the ultimate. He's had great accuracy so far. Mm -hmm. He's only missed one, I believe. Uh, yeah, it was a dodge by Ninja in the mid lane, and then he landed one onto Prox and afterwards. So 50%, one and one, I believe, but didn't miscount here. And we'll see what the next one ends up being. Good dodge and Hakuho's Q, which is Bite does not find its teeth. Yeah, without that mid lane turret for Envy, that frees up Jensen so much. And with that Rylai's Crystal Scepter and the advantage that he Ooh. has, he just is tanky, though. Yeah, he just kills off the ward anyway and just walks away, barely even takes damage. But another Drake coming down. Envy taking a look at the Cloud Drake here. So basically their combination is giving them rotational turret pushing power as much as they can maybe play that, which honestly is kind of the game they played yeah. in the first place. So uh, if they're not really trying to team fight, these are probably the, the ideal ones. That's an if, of course. If they get locked in combat, it turns off entirely. These are not PvP in almost any way. These aren't even like really movement speed based catching champions, right? Yeah. If like it was a Sejuani or a Gragas, Cloud Drake is actually one of your best team fight tools because you'll actually catch someone. For a Swain, okay, less so. Yeah, I mean, they actually gave up this top turret for for that. Uh, right, yeah. Laud and Hakuo could have saved it. They were standing at their tier two just because they didn't want to walk up and they had no vision inside their top yeah. jungle. When Meteos is around, an impact can always show up. Mm -hmm. That's the big thing is that that stand united, we haven't really seen it come through yet.
but it'll allow Impact to enter these fights, and you have to keep it in consideration. The funny thing is, like, Seraph has almost been able to keep his teleport up now for most of this game, so he could theoretically match Impact with these plays. Ninja hasn't done anything at all. Jensen's just won his lane so hard that Ninja's teleporting back to his own lane after dying and never getting that global pressure. So Envy, I, I know, again, they play very slow, so this isn't, like, that worrying, but they're really doing nothing with the double teleport. Yeah. Well, they were coming back from, like, 6k gold advantages in favor of Immortals, sure. right? So they play very slow games. It's all about that side wave manipulation. Ooh. Saw them down in kills, and they were still even in gold. And we're seeing this 2k gold advantage right now kind of spread out among members. It's not 200 here, 200 there. But it's massive for Jensen. Jensen is 2,000 gold up over Ninja. Yeah. That's huge. You have to shut down this Cassiopeia because he's basically got the Cassiopeia dream going for mm -hmm. him right now. Well, it is a teleportless mid laner. So if Jensen's not there, Envy's ahead. They've got two Drakes they can actually use for some level of power here. It even has the Rift Hero buff. Like, all of C9's lead is actually Jensen right now. And yeah, many people believe that even though Cloud9's record is not as good as Team Envy's, they are the favorite here, and I would kind of tend to agree, but there's still a chance there. Envy runs on in, try to zone out the team, and they will knock this turret down. Drake's really work for them as they've brought the gold lead closer. 800 gold for a turret, and only 13, 1400 the difference now. Even though their kills don't look impressive, the fantasy points aren't yet there for Envy. This game is absolutely winnable. Yeah, very much so. Power spikes coming through. We have two items for most of the members of Envy, Laud and Ninja. And very close to having that mock completed as well for Proxen. Yeah. Seraph, a little bit of a detour in his build, though. Going to go for the Spirit Visage because the Cassiopeia is just so big. Absolutely. It makes a whole lot of sense. And, and as well, I actually don't know for sure. I'd have to check with someone who knows the actual numbers. But uh, I don't know if Spirit Visage and Ignite scale additively or multiplicatively. Right, because Ignite's going to cut healing by 40%, and Spirit yeah. Visage is going to add 20%. I think you do the Spirit Visage first, and then you do the other. Yeah, so the question is, do you go to 80%, or do you go to, you know, 1.2 times 0.6, which is a smaller number? I think it's I think it's that one. Okay. <laughs> I think it's the second one. And actually, there's also the 8% from the Mastery he's running, so there's all kinds of ways it could be. Yeah. Which, by the way, if it is additive, it really destroys what Ignite does to you. Because instead of being at 60, you're at 80%, which, mm -hmm. is, which is more than 20% better, right? You're 33% better. So, math, yay. Yeah. You can never escape a cat. I'm though. pretty sure it's Spirit Visage goes first and then Ignite. Yeah, if, if they multiply, that's, that's the other way around, of course. So, either way, Seraph is going to keep, keep his healing up as best he can. Of course, it works on allied healing, too, which means blood charges and summoner heals from Lucian will help a little bit. And even though uh, it's ninja casting a shield, the Asthidines will heal. It doesn't make the shield bigger. It makes him actually heal mm -hmm. off of shield usage. Yep. He has to actually do ma damage, though. He has to get right. his Q off. Right, poke. A, luckily, though, it's pre-mitigated damage that's stored. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, it'll actually work with Deathfire Touch as well. It just matters that he deals damage at all. So little things that could add up there for ninja. A little bit of poke on a Hakuho. Doesn't mean too much, though, as now the Hurricane and S3 are done, so Sneaky has high amounts of cooldown reduction. Lod goes towards his Bloodthirst. He's already power spiked as best as he can be, though. It kind of starts to go downhill from here for Lucian. Yeah, it looks like he's going to start going towards an Essence Reaver at the moment. It's that or Bloodthirst, I don't know which. Probably Bloodthirst, because he's already at 30 CDR, right? Yeah. That'd be really surprising if he went for that, because it's that's, practically useless. That's true, and it wouldn't, it wouldn't have anything to multiply the crit of. Yeah, I mean, you would max at 10 regardless. Like, you've already got 30, so, yeah. Oh, you mean the crit for damage? Obviously. Yeah. Yeah, I get you what you're saying now. I, I, I misunderstood you. Nice turret pickup for impact, despite not getting Mountain Drake takes it down anyway. And Envy are still losing in that uh, that one-on-one -on -one matchup with Impact versus Seraph. Arrow's gonna land onto Lod. The shield comes up, blocks the Nami, and here comes the team fight. Jensen's gonna get a shot on top of him. They're gonna knock down one. Braum is dead. A beautiful top from Impact means two more. What a great team fight for Cloud9, three to zero. And Seraph didn't have a TP location in that fight. He had minions in the middle of the wave, but they didn't put down a ward for him, and that's gonna be Cloud9 turning onto the Baron after a great team fight. Sure, how is Seraph and Lod going to stop this? It's a five-man Baron attempt early on into the game. What a nice situation for Cloud9 to be in, taking control, finding the one team fight they needed, and there is no one even trying to steal. A good spike by Medios and a big lead for Cloud9. Yep, Cloud9 
jump out to a large lead there. They force the issue. The Ash Arrow hits Lod. They can't really ditch him. He stops there for a second, flashes up and everything. Hakuo stops it, stops the wave, but then the taunt across two catches so them good. even more. Impact with the flash taunt so he can actually go through people as opposed to the taunt flash and land right on them. Yeah, Seraph not being there at all was a huge, huge issue right there. I don't know if Hakuo didn't have any wards left up or what, but if he was there, that fight would have been differently because the early burst, Bravo to hit multiple, you had Illusion putting a Q across, and you had uh, Monster, a lot of damage yeah. Graves. Most of C9's backline was below half health before the fight even started. If there was a Swain, they cannot get that follow through damage, and that mm -hmm. fight goes very differently. So, Seraph not being there, a huge issue, and it's part of the reason that Envy are now losing by quite a lot here. Yeah, not a kill for them yet. They've been slowly kind of losing a lot of their matchups here. The mid lane and the top lane, the ones that they usually rely on. Whereas Lod, still consistent right now, but Sneaky has been leaving lane, making plays with his arrows. And Lod hasn't been able to keep up. They're going to lose even more for this. Because that Baron buff, they just can't contest it right now on Envy's side. Really nice stuff by Cloud9 kind of to crystallize what their strategy sort of is. It's they kind of play all three lanes. And then as soon as Sneaky joins Jensen, Impact can join on a whim. Just the dual lane just rotates up to where Jensen is and says, pick him off, let's go. For an and all five are there, right? And if it doesn't land, walk back. It's not like Envy is great playmaking. They have uh -huh. no engaged tools except a flash bra multi. Like, Envy can't force their will. The Lissandra band that came out in the beginning of the draft, kind of part of the reason. A nice arrow lands again in a proxen. Going to be the knockup into the title. Into the kill, picked up. Sneaky gets that one. 8 0. Cloud9 knocked down a fifth turret as well. Envy holding their flashes on these arrows all the time. He slides basically in a line. Perpendicular, you yeah. have to go perpendicular. Mid turret's gonna go down as well. Now on to Lod, gets the slow, can't dash just yet. But then again by the Karma, still wants in, but the shield comes in. Hakuo saves him for now. A nice four man hit on that one as they walk slowly forward, get nothing done. But well, Lod survived the encounter. Mid lane inhibitor goes down, and Cloud9 crushing this game absolutely now. Yeah, Cloud9 performing incredibly well in this game. A lot of those engages. Throwing Envy off. Envy, they do have disengage, but it's not very good against these stuns. The stuns that are coming out. I mean, even if you hit Hakuo, right? They have enough first to take him out. Yeah. Ninjas, same story. This is all kite back. I mean, the problem is Envy never got themselves into a team fight. Yeah. Three minutes ago, if Seraph was there, that would have been a close five on five. But at this point, like, if your if your goal is to drain tank. You cannot drain tank when you're down on stats. Yeah. Like, this entire composition now is predicated on the fact that they can fight equally and just out-shield and out-heal the damage. This no longer exists. I don't even see a win condition for Envy anymore. They can't play make. They can't 5-on-5. Five five, they can't split push. They don't do more damage. I think C9 can walk this one in. Yeah, with the 10,000 gold advantage they have at 30 minutes, Yeah. Like Cloud9 are in a fantastic position here. Jensen is 4,000 gold up over Ninja. You just look at the items that he has. He has four completed items, and the beauty of Cassiopeia is you don't have to get boots. Yep. So he gets, he can get even more. He gets to carry a pink ward, <laughs> which is actually better. To be honest, <laughs> at this stage of the game, you don't need more stats. Just don't get caught out randomly. And Cloud9 are looking wonderful now in this one. And we'll see how quickly they can close it out, because 99% of the time, Cloud9 wins this game. An arrow onto Ninja, the bubble to taunt the damage up, but Ninja doesn't get to do anything at all. He is dead. Next one's coming up. The volley's going to land, and yeah, that's a kill. Picked up a spree now for Sneaky. They knocked down one more. 10-0 the kill scoreboard right here. In fact, doesn't even get stunned. They just picked up two champions. The Soul Laners of Envy are dead, and there's two inhibitors down. They're going to go in for the Nexus itself, it looks like, but there's no waves yet. They've got a ways to wait. Cloud9, absolutely methodical this game. The arrows from Sneaky, get the engage, Flash and there they go. Lands, Bubbles, not quite going to hit, but they still pick up a lot. He is gone now on this one. Hakuho slowed and chased down, gets ripped apart as well. Prox in the last man alive, trying to clear the waves. Caught under the turret, goes down. A double kill for Jensen, 6 0 5 for the Cassiopeia, 13 0. And Cloud9 with a greatly controlled game, winning their lanes, winning the team fights, and taking game one in style. Absolutely dominant there, not giving up a single kill to Envy that game. Envy in third, Cloud9 in fourth, but right now, Cloud9 are kind of halting that hype train. They are. Cloud9 sitting at four and two in the record, but they only play teams below them in the standings after this one, and if they knock down Envy, then it's all teams below them here at this point. Cloud9 looking like one of the top three teams in NA with a game like that, absolutely. 
Yeah, and NB have a lot to discuss after that because their draft, you know, they were taking away these picks like the karma from the support, but they didn't really have any ways in. They didn't have ways to force the issue. They didn't really have ways to actually start and impose their will on the other team. Yeah. It was all kite backwards, hope they engage on you. And sure, Cloud9 did, but it was all arrows. It's still long range engage with the Cassiopeia and keeping her safe. Yeah. So it was honestly for them very difficult for Envy to play the game out past the draft phase when they started to get behind in the lanes. Totally agree. So a great game and a great draft by Cloud9. That's going to do it for us for this game. We're going to actually toss it over to the other stream where you can check in on how Echo Fox vs. TSM is going. Baron back up. And with the inhibitors up, that'll be very good for TSM. You can see how far they want to get that mid wave pushed out so it's not instantly crashing in to their base. Yeah, this is a really pivotal point in the game because at this point, repelling the push, getting inhibitors to respawn, TSM can still actually win this if they get a mm -hmm. proper team fight. They had such a big advantage that despite the collapse, it's still close. And Les Van Scarum gets caught. Hanser's not even here. The bubble goes in to give him speed and stop the other team, but he gets taken down by Keith. And that was the, may have been the dust blade if it took him out. The cooldown actually didn't come up, so it wasn't the kill. Yeah, it was probably the death fire touch right, right. there because that's the mastery that Jin brings. Mm -hmm. Here though, Mountain Drake and Cassiopeia. So Echo Fox can take the Baron very quickly. No Sven Scarin for TSM. They would have to fight this four versus five. And That's look at, a great poke. Look at this route here coming in from KFO as well. He's going to want to stop these minion waves the as well as say, hey, guys, I'm going to start the super minions back up <laughs> once again. You're going to have to send someone to respect this. What's interesting is he could actually run at the Nexus right now. Nope, second inhibitor respawn. Yep, <laughs> just in time. Yeah, it's, this actually isn't going to give him anything. I don't like that move from KFO. It uh, looked good. He's not a Jax or anything. It takes him about 45 seconds to kill an inhibitor by himself without minions. So if anything, KFO should have gotten the minion wave going because the minions can threaten the inhibitor. Yeah. Uh, but that actually didn't force a response at all, and now they can both match with teleport. So Echo Fox doesn't make any use out of the pick they got on a Sven Scarin outside of the immediate hold value. Uh, and now he's picked himself a fight. The I red don't buff means know. Hauser can win this. If he wants it. Sunfire Cave's burning, but it's healed through by Hauntzer at this point. Equilibrium They're going in. not going to be there. He goes for the team. Big goes down. They're trying to win. They're trying it. to win. KFO's in. They're onto the Nexus. They took down the, or they took down the inhibitor. Onto the Nexus now. They're going to be doing what they can to get it. Hard's on the other side, swinging away. KFO alive. This oh, is going to go. work. They throw it. Can it go all the way down now? It's going to be 45 to 50 seconds on Echo Fox as they had a go for broke rush for TSM's Nexus. What is it about? Nexus rushes this week. G2 had a couple of them that were unsuccessful. Echo Fox tried to get it. It's not a good plan to try and rush the Nexus when the entire enemy team is alive. First off, Shen is very low when they're coming in here, and they had a bit of an angle, but Azir and Lucian have a bunch of damage. Tidal Wave slows down pretty much no one there, and Frog and Keith come around the backside, but he just pushes them back into the base because of the angle they had taken. They don't have enough damage. And like technically, they could go for another rush. Oh no! I, I, I like it. Uh, something about it being real bad is what he said right there. That's Baron down to. Ladies and gentlemen, game one crazy. of the day already very crazy. Those of you coming over from the C9 NV game uh, who got a little peek in on the TSM Fox game, we'll continue to check in with that one as it happens because very close. Fox narrowly uh, missing uh, yeah, just, victory just tunnel over tunnel vision a little bit. Man, that was cool. well. That that's that that's that immortals envy kind of situation where yeah. everyone clicked the nexus. Can they get it? They don't quite. But uh, before we get back to the TSM and Fox game and see how that one turned out, let's go ahead and break down C9's very clinical victory over Envy in game one. And somewhat surprising given the fact that we look at these two teams being in the top four, we expect a very a much closer match. But uh, in standard lanes, C9 getting a few ganks off, few kills early, and just kind of rolling that advantage through. I think the big thing is Meteos. Uh, it was standard lanes. You can see Reaper talking to them here. Is that? Oh, that's Bunny. For a second, I thought that was Meteos. I was like, wow, he got swagged yeah, out really shades, quick. Shades, man. No, no, that's that's Bunny. But uh, Meteos had a really good early game. He got a gank off mid, got some ganks off top. Mm -hmm. um, Proxim was farming a lot, and so he, he was a, a gold lead a little bit, but Meteos turning those ganks gave him a little bit of control early. And then 
Um, then once we saw the mid game start rolling around, they go for the Rift Herald fight, they get that one, they get another mm -hmm. fight mid lane, and from, I mean, C9 was just in control the whole way. And Bunny Fufu being in the foreground there, of course, he'll be moving in for game two, no surprise, but uh, having the advantage of having seen game one, hopefully we'll be able to come in for C9 and execute even more cleanly uh, for a, a second victory. But diving into gameplay, as you mentioned, of course, Medios, a uh, lot of pressure, both to the mid lane and the top lane, choosing ganks over the objective control that Envy had on, on the first few dragons but those ganks eventually turning into turrets that they could take and good fights. I want to jump into our first replay. 18 minutes into the game, Cloud9 is going to go for that Rift Herald. Uh, Envy, though, choosing an interesting fight here, ends up 2 for 0 in Cloud9's favor. I mean, they think they're in a good spot because C9 is dealing with the Rift Herald. It's 3 versus 3, but they're split up. So C9, as soon as they finish the Rift Herald, just go instantly onto Prox, and they chunk him out of the fight. Now Seraph's in the middle. Now it's Ninja's focus. So it's the kind of situation where, even though it's a 3v3, they're, they're too split this up. This arrow. And this Ooh. is such a good arrow. Oh. Because usually what happens is you kind of just like shoot it at a clump across the map. And right. like if it hits, it's it's not, I wouldn't say luck, but it's chance, right? Where, yeah. Whereas that one, like he knew exactly who he was aiming at. He knew where to lead it, and he just sniped him perfectly. So yeah. that was a really impressive that shot. That was very pretty. He's been making his own case for a highlight reel against Fabi on the Ash Arrows. Yeah. But we got to move to player of the game on this one. It's going to go to Medios for that early action that he created. Some sweet pathing by him in the jungle. He, he definitely on Rek'Sai. I mean, Rek'Sai is a versatile jungle champion. You were talking about... Uh, during the game and allowed Meteos to have some innovative jungle pathing that caught ND off guard. Right, it's a nice thing where you start on the top side, jungle through only three camps to get your buff on the bot side, gets the scuttle crab down there to get vision for his bot lane who wants to, you know, with smoothie play a little bit aggressive, and then he heads back top side, jungle mm -hmm. back off, hands the blue off. These kinds of plays are really only doable on Rek'Sai, and it, it just allows a smart player like Meteos to shine. Yeah, but at the same time, nobody died on the team, right? So this right. is one of those situations where player of the game gets kind of hard when everybody <laughs> so is can... performing well, yeah. uh, but but all in all, we look at him as the, you know, the guy who kind of catalyzed. Yeah. Yeah. Look at us hey. in sync. Uh, it only took us four weeks, right? Yeah, Jesus. Uh, but, but no, no, definitely we look at him as kind of the, the guy who got him off the ground. But Jensen definitely playing into that 2v2 in the mid lane well and, and all of that. Um, you know, on the side of Envy, I don't want to say things aren't looking well. I mean, it definitely wasn't a fantastic game from them. But we like to think, as we see them on your screens here now, discussing what changes and adjustments they should make for game two. But this is a roster that can bounce back and has shown a whole lot of fight when it comes to these best of threes. I think that their comp is not a great comp from behind. You have okay. Swain and Karma. Uh, Karma's an enabler. Swain wants to be this tanky, unkillable thing. And, and he was farming pretty well, but he went for a, a little bit of greedy, a greedy build, greedy build yeah. with the, the tier catalyst. And so uh, once they start falling behind, he doesn't have quite the tank stats he should. And then when Karma's shielding you, that's not as powerful. Uh, Lod's behind as well. And it's one of those, those comps that... Just it, from ahead, it will look dominant and crushing. From behind, it looks a little underwhelming. And I think they kind of fell victim to getting outplayed, and then their comp falls behind. For those of you worried that you might be missing the TSM Fox game, currently in a pause, so don't worry about that. Stick with us. We'll make sure we get We're you to the action. We're more entertaining anyway. Exactly. Yeah, we'll cares? make sure we get you to the action when the important stuff uh, goes down. Continuing along the C9 Envy uh, situation, you did mention the comp. So what kind of adjustments uh, do you want to see Envy make? Because... This is a very this is a very powerful comp if you are ahead, as you mentioned, right? But uh, but do they need to now be concerned that uh, C9 has a strong enough early game? They need to build into their composition some more fail safes. I think part of it is too is the blue side. When your blue side uh, C9 was blue side game one, they right. were able to target a lot of bands towards Envy. Uh, the Sandra one in particular is just a power pick for Envy, and taking that off both Seraph and Ninja is a is a great ban. And once you flip over to red side. C9 will be in a tougher spot with like you banning the Arise, the Azir, and mm -hmm. Lissandra, like, or you leave all the jungle picks up for Prox and exactly what's happening. So I think uh, they should be freed up a little bit in their draft on blue side, and I hope to see them get their Lissandra or Trundle or something that's a little bit better for, for uh, Seraph to go off on. Well, once again, with a win under their belt, Cloud9 is going to be bringing in Bunny Foo for, uh, for game two. Uh, but this is a situation where uh, I, I, it makes sense, right? Because even if they drop this game, Smoothie can come back in and they still have that one game buffer. So having started with the win definitely helps them in this sub situation. Uh, but with Bunny Fufu, uh, thoughts on that? Do you? Uh, we've been told, what we've heard right through, through players is that Bunny is a little bit less aggressive in lane. Smoothie is definitely uh, a little bit more in your face. And we saw it very immediately, the Nami Ash pushing uh, Laud and Hakuho in right. consistently. Yeah, I think... Um... I personally think Smoothie is definitely playing better so far this season. Okay. Both, both have had highs and lows, um, but more recently Smoothie's been playing better. But I think he's also less... Uh, he's, he's in standard lanes more often, which is definitely one of his strengths. And I think he just ends up in positions that are really good for him. And I think, you know, part of it, he's putting himself in those positions as well. And he's definitely roaming well and influencing the team game. But he's also never, like, 
is less frequently in those terrible 2v1s where they're getting outplayed by like a TSM or something. So I think, I think part of it is, is the circumstance, but individually I do think he's playing better as well. Cloud9 off to a good start. Envy though looking to strike back. Of course, TSM and Fox are just getting back into the game from the pause. So if you want to check that out, head over to NALCS2 to catch the end of that very exciting game. We've got more action coming up right after this though. Stay tuned to see if Cloud9 can take game two and close out the series or if Envy will force a game three. Or as I said, hop over to that other stream, see how it turns out. We'll be right back.